Rabotei, we are approaching the Ilula of the Orachayim HaKadosh, and I want to present to you a fascinating recount of his trip from Livorno to Eretz Israel. It's known that Orachayim HaKadosh traveled from Morocco where he was born and he wrote a lot of his farim, traveled to Livorno. He printed a lot of his farim in Livorno. And from there, it seems to be that there was a funder who funded a trip of him and an entourage, we're going to see of 30 people, to move from Livorno to Yerushalayim and to set up a yeshiva there, which he did. And this is a letter basically giving the feedback, it seems to be to the donor, about what has been, uh, what, what transpired. And we're going to see some fascinating details and we could learn some halachot and miracles as well from this trip. The name of this chacham was Rabbi Avram Sangoniti, was Rabbi Avram Sangoniti. And, uh, and it was printed, recently reprinted, these, uh, this, uh, these letters were printed, I think, for the first time in the year Tavshin uh, Ayin He, around eight, uh, seven years ago, uh, from uh, Harav Chacham uh, Oed Torjaman Shlita from Eretz Yisrael. He reprinted these. And, uh, and we'll, we'll go through some of the fascinating details. He starts off by saying the following. Their first stop from Livorno, they traveled, interesting, the date when they traveled was on Rosh Chodesh Av. Was on Rosh Chodesh Av. Which you would think is not the optimal tri- time to travel. It's right, right starting the nine days. And you would think to take a dangerous journey, which they were going to take, uh, they were going to take a boat to Eretz Yisrael. It was, they were going to see it was quite dangerous. But that's when they traveled. It seems to be that they, they felt, since this is going for a Dvar Mitzvah, there is, no, uh, there's, there's no issue whatsoever. So that's fascinating. Number one, they got to a city called Sevilla. There he mentions, it took them tough kuf mil, 500 mil, or, and he calls it 500 meot mil. I don't exactly know what distance that is. And they got to... They got, it's around, the, the, it's around 2,500 kilometers from uh, Livorno to Sevilla. So uh, I don't exactly know how, how he made the calculation of tough kuf of uh, 500, 500 meals. I, mean, made, I think it's 500 uh, times 5. Okay, either way, they get Lel Shabbat Kodesh to, uh, to, uh, to Sevilla, it was the 8th of Av, okay? So this is kind of like this year where Tisha B'Av is going to fall out on a sun, is going to fall out on a Shabbat and it's pushed off to Sunday. Says Rabbi Avraham, a great wave of sea came upon us and we almost, we almost died. Okay, so they took the boat to Spain and they almost died. Well, let's think about it. It was the day before Tisha B'Av. Doesn't occur to him whatsoever. He doesn't, he doesn't make an issue about it whatsoever. Fascinating. Kim'at ainu avudim. And all of our material were going to be thrown off the boat. Baruch Hashem. Uh, ha- throughout half of the night, the, the sea calmed down and Hashem sent this calmness that we could get to this uh, city properly. Says, uh, says the Igeret HaMasav, Rabbi Avram, student of Dorachim HaKadosh. We get to, we finally got on the night, Motzei Shabbat, we got to a big mountain, and around this mountain, he, 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 uh, he describes, there is no boat that could go there, because this place lets out great rocks all day, and, and during the day you have a pillar of smoke coming and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, flames that are coming out of this place, basically a volcano, right? And especially at night, it keeps on going stronger. It goes up at least six feet high. And, and different uh, coals fall into the, uh, into the sea. And it does, it's very interesting, he says, at night, that's when it spews all of its, uh, all, all of its uh, lava, but during the day, you don't see the fire so much. So either way, he, he thought it was fascinating. Uh, first time, I guess, he saw a volcano. And, um, and, and uh, he mentioned that sometimes 
this fire that comes out goes more than 40 amot. He, he, he goes on and on talking about this, this, one, this volcano that to be sure they didn't approach. It says the next day was Tisha, that was Tisha B'Av, right? It was the 10th of Av. It was, that's when they fasted. That's when they got to their city. He doesn't mention how they, how they did Tisha B'Av. He mentions that they fasted. The Goyim accepted them with great love. But, guess what? They weren't allowed to, to get off the boat and just be part of the land and prepare themselves for the next leg of the journey because there was something called quarantine. Quarantina, he calls it. They don't know where they're coming from and they want to make sure that they're safe. So every person has a different quarantine. Some people need seven days. Some people need more. We got there. We got to a house, says Rabbi Avram, and he describes something fascinating. He says, they got to a house that there was a inner chamber that there was two places to go to. And under one of the places, which was under a vineyard, there was two priests, Bet Komrim. And here, they are the interrogators. Border control. And they are asking them, what are they doing over here? They want to know all of their details. They ask them, are you Jewish? Or are you non-Jewish? Or are you from Edom? It's a third category. So they told them, we are Jewish. And Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, we got over here. This, these two priests tell them, we're very happy that we saw Jews over here. How many are you? They said, we are 30. They said, Halivai, you would be 30,000 and you would come to our city and you would be able to do business in our city. And if you want to carry weapons, you could also, no gun control over here. And everything is in front of you that you could, you could, uh, you could do business in this land. And, there is, and as long as they checked their temperatures, he said, and he saw that they were all healthy and they didn't have any plague upon them, they let them, they let them, they let them go. And they, as long as they did their quarantine of seven days. Says Rabbi Avram, after they finished their seven days on, a, uh, on, a, uh, on, on, a, on a, the third day, which is on a Tuesday, they got a letter that whoever wants to go, go tour and so buy stuff, he says that actually they didn't have to wait seven days. He says it was the Tuesday, it was three days later. They said you could go and you could start buying stuff. There was a person who started showing them around and they found out that he was a scammer. Okay, not so, not so relevant to us. Eventually, they, they saw that all of their business was with silk. Even some of their houses were made uh, like uh, draped with silk. They, they stood in, the, they stayed in the land there for um, 17 days to benefit and to, uh, and, and, to, and to take part of this land. They thought it was fascinating and uh, it could be that there was other reasons why they stayed in the land. We'll see later that they, there was a, a plague going on in Yerushalayim. There was houses that they found that had mezuzot, that that's where the Jews um, that the, that's where the Jews escaped from. But basically, after they stayed for a while and they saw they, they did what they were able to do, they were ready to move on and to leave to Alexandria. So here we are. Uh, once, they got to, once they got to the land, which was on the 10th of Av, they left again on a Friday. And here he writes... Um, he, here he writes, they left on the 11th of Av, which is 11 days later. Although he writes that they, they stayed for 17 days. It's a little bit of a contradiction, but either way. They, he writes over here, they left from their next stop from Sevilla to go to Alexandria in Egypt. And Alexandria, they, they, they decided that that's where they're, um, they're, they're going to... They're going to take their next leg of their journey to go to Eretz Yisrael. Now, once they got to Alex, once they got on the boat, they also said it wasn't so simple. Their boat almost broke. You're going to see there was wasn't easy travel in those days to get to Eretz Yisrael. And he writes like this: We got out of the danger. 
ובירכנו הגומל לחייבים טובות על הכל הטובות שאמר לנו הקפיטן שהיינו מסוכנים ועל כן קראנו הגומל. So they wouldn't have read הגומל just by taking a short boat ride it seems. It seems to be because they were in danger and they got out of the danger so they, they blessed הגומל. Or maybe they were waiting to say הגומל after a long trip but here they had an immediate miracle happen to them so they decided to say הגומל. So I thought that was actually quite a fascinating point. We're going to see a few fascinating halachic tidbits that happened in this trip. So let's continue. They get to Alexandria. It took around half a day in the port and they, when they finally get uh, to, to, to Alexandria, they said they waited, uh, they, they waited a week over there and there was, uh, there, there was, um, there, there was a wind. Either way, they, they, they waited over there, it seems to be, in the port. When they finally docked and went out, they saw the beautiful place of Alexandria and here they mention that um, that they saw the Kehillah there and they saw a, a, a wonderful, wonderful Bet Knesset. They said it was a very big Bet Knesset that it had, it had uh, alleys, it had, it, had, it had a basement, it had, a, it, it, had a, it had gardens and orchards And he writes like this, it had a cave underneath that had a tremendous light and anybody who was ever sick would come over there and right away be healed, says, the, uh, says Rabbi Avram. Continues on, he says, we prayed and we saw that it was a, a very big place. It seems to be that it was such a big, a big, a big Bet HaKnesset He writes that this is possibly the Bet Knesset that was mentioned in the time of the Gemara, that we know that there's a Bet Knesset of Alexandria that was so big that when the Chazan would do a bracha for the people in the back to know that it was time to answer Amen, they'd have a person with a white flag waving the flag and saying it's time for them to answer Amen. So he says he believes that that was the Bet Knesset. Either way, mm -hmm. they, um, they, they got there, they got there, and they, he also mentions that in this Bet Knesset, He saw a great, uh, 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 two great pillars. And on the bottom of the pillars, there was a, a copper, uh, uh, a, a copper um, bottom that there was a Mesora that there used to be some type of picture that Paro used to go there and he used to serve a, a piece of copper over there. And uh, so he, 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 this is very interesting. Either way, he calls his Bet Knesset that they called Knesset Eliyahu. They get there on... So they get there, it's already now Sunday. They prayed Shacharit Mincha and they made a special tefillah in Yerushalayim because in Yerushalayim a plague was going on. And they were very sad about that because they had to wait and they had to make sure that people are healthy in Yerushalayim. So he mentions that they found a mikveh in this Beta Knesset, which a lot of Sephardic Beta Knesset had a built in mikveh that people would go to very. Every single day, it seemed, you know, in Morocco that was the case. And I know that, uh, I know in, in, over here, it seems to be in Alexandria, they had built in a mikveh. More than a hundred feet. Right, Shabbi Avram, we did many tevilot there. Ube vadai, this is for anybody who mentions that, oh, maybe it wasn't the Sephardic minhag to go to, to, for men to go to the mikveh. He says, ube vadai, kol haoset tevilot sham, whoever does tevilah over there, For sure he gets a neshama yitera from this. And then he writes, this is where we heard that this is the, the famous uh, Bet Knesset of Alexandria. There was many, there was many gardens, as, as he mentions. We, they waited there for 14 days until they heard that the Malach HaMashchit calmed down and there wasn't a plague anymore. And here he writes the next leg of their journey. This is fascinating over here. The next leg of their journey, they decided to go. They were going to go from Alexandria to the port of Yafo. Yafo would take them 12, it would take them a day and a half to travel from Yafo to Yerushalayim. And it seems to be that it was an easy road. It, 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 was, uh, it was an easy road to go. He says, actually, um, it should have been an, only a three-day trip if the winds are good. But the captain forgot his GPS. And the captain, instead of going to Yafo, the boat started going towards Akko. And here they were very upset. Here's writes Rabbi Avram, they were very upset. Because to get from Akko to Yerushalayim, 
It's a five or six day journey and it's dangerous. There's no real good roads there. And they have women and children that are not going to be able to travel properly. So he told the captain, you have to go to Yafo. The captain said, I can't. He said, we'll pay you whatever money. First of all, he said, give us back a refund. They had a refund policy in place. The guy was, gave him 200 coins back as a refund. Still didn't go back to Yafo. And they didn't understand why. And here's what's fascinating. Finally, when they get to Akko, they hear that there was a still the major play going on. Every day in Yafo, 12 people were dying, which was a lot. It wasn't a big population. And Yerushalayim, many more. And he says, Baruch Hashem, writes Rabbi Avram, that, Ve'elokim chashva tova. Hashem was watching out for us. Ki be'emet le'ako shamanu shmot ra'od le'yafo, Meliam magifau bechol yom yafo metim yudbet metim yudbet. He says that that there was many people dying in Yafo and they didn't understand, but that's why Hashem sent them. So everything was mina shamayim. And he says we were we were very happy that Hashem did us did us this chesed. Finally, we get to Yafo, and here he's going to mention what the uh, uh, I'm sorry they got to Akko, and here he's going to start. This is going to be the part two of our series. What happened from Akko to Yerushalayim? He's got, I just got, I'm going to start a little bit of the subject that uh, uh, how they got there. The number one is that there was a hundred balebatim Yehudim, but most of the city was populated by Greeks and by Turkish. They get to a big bit Knesset that there are 250 uh, people. And anybody who comes in has to pay a fee. There's a tax. There's a box there. Whether the box is full or not full, there was a tax that you had to pay. And he says, Akko is a fascinating city because half of it is in Eretz Yisrael. Half of it is in Chutz Aretz. They only do one day of Moed. They don't do two days. And on Chola Moed, they do... Like Chutz Laaretz, which I didn't understand. If they only do one day, so why Cholomor they do Chutz Laaretz? I don't understand. It says they did Rosh Hashanah there. After Rosh Hashanah, they traveled four hours in order to get to the kever of Chushi HaArachi. Who was Chushi? Chushi was one of the advisors of David HaMelech. He said they, 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 when they got to this place where there was many buildings, some of them were fallen, some of them were still there. They got to a place called Kfar Yashiv. It's a fascinating Kfar. It's already mentioned in the Zohar. It says, in this place of Kfar Yashiv, there's great abundance. And it's, it's Mamash Eretz Yisrael. We found 10 people, Asara Balabatim, that are sitting there and they are reaping the soil and they are eating from their fruits of their labor. And here it is, the year Tav Kuf Bet, which is uh, 200 and uh, Tav Kuf Bet, we're, we're talking about it's, um, it's uh, 280 years ago. 280 years ago. Since that was the year of Shvi'it, 280 years ago, he writes, they weren't, they weren't reaping the land. So here's another interesting tidbit. They were keeping Shvi'it then. And this is one of the most fascinating parts of the letter. They don't have any galut where they are. Somebody who, because obviously somebody who sits and learns Torah and has the air of Eretz Yisrael that makes a person wise is able to learn and the, the Parnasa over there is, is not expensive. Water there was for everyone. And he quote, writes and I quote, The end benehem, they don't have amongst them. Lo kina, no jealousy, velo sina, no hatred, lo tacharut, kalvikar, no competition at all. There's no rat race. Everyone is sitting under their own tree. They don't wear enam lovshim malbushim tovim. They don't wear fancy clothing. They have one malbush that they wear for Shabbat and Yom Tov. And that's because they're not looking for kavod for their, their own selves. So he's saying it's an amazing piece of information that we all make life complicated for us. We have to have this and that and that when really we could be sitting quietly learning Torah and not having to deal with insurances or whatever else you have to deal with and making life easy for yourself. 
they got to this kvar and that's where he saw this model Jewish community going on. Either way, they got to this kvar of Chushi. And it was in a house, he even describes how it was shaped. It had a dome upon it. He makes a little picture over here. I don't know if you can see the picture. That's how he makes the picture over here. And he says, we, we sat there in the kevers. On Friday, we learned the Itzot and what David HaMelech uh, 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 got from Chushi. We learned Selichot. We cried. And we cried on the Galut that Hashem should send us to Ir Kochen Yerushalayim. So it's amazing that they went dafka to this kever of Chushi Arachi. And they prayed a lot over there. And, they, and they, you see what they did by the Kvarim. They also learned the material from this Chacham. Eventually, they got back to Akko. And, uh, and, and, uh, and they, they, they found a, a synagogue over there that had 12 windows, just like the 12 windows in Livorno. And it was called the Bet Knesset of Achav, the wicked king of Achav. And they say that's where he used to pray. Fascinating. Next time, we're going to learn about uh, the, next, uh, the next travel and journey that they had. Uh, it brought them on Erev Yom Kippur and how they celebrated their Yom Kippur. Uh, in a me'ara of Elio and Navi. That's going to be fascinating stuff for next time. Chazaku Baruch.